I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, we were just talking about how much ground we're going to cover. And, you know, we've got a, a wide variety of topics today. Yes, I'm really excited. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Appreciate you. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat function to interact with us. And if you're on YouTube, and we appreciate you being there, you can send us an email at UK Forestry Extension, and, and we will respond um, to that as well. Yes, today's show, very exciting. Really excited to have some guests on. We've got some reoccurring guests, but good topics and new topics for all of them. We have Dr. Jonathan Larson, our resident entomologist on From the Woods today. Um, he's going to be talking about some really cool moss. Um, I think everybody's going to get a kick out of it. We always love having um, Dr. Larson on. Um, we also have Megan Buland on. She always brings us some cool little um, fungus out there and, and lets us know what's going on out in the natural world. So we're glad to have uh, Megan with us as, as well. And then Dr. Jeff Stringer has put together a video on uh, different treatments of trees. You know, Renee, in forestry, a lot of the work we do actually ends up killing some trees to promote other trees, right? Um, so you need to know how to do that in the best way you can. So we've got a nice video um, that Dr. Stringer's put together with the team um, talking about different treatment overviews. So it'll be a great resource for anybody that's out there trying to manage their property for wildlife or woodlands. Um, it, it'll be very helpful to them. So great show. Glad to have all our guests on today. Definitely. And remember, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat pod or send an, an email to forestry.extension at uky.edu. So let's go ahead and get started. So Dr. Larson, if you'd like to turn on your camera. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to the show. We appreciate you being on. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. So it looks like you're going to talk about something really interesting today. Yeah, I actually, uh, I was really excited when you contacted me because you kind of, for lack of a better term, you kind of gave me a blank check. You were just like, you know, what do you want to talk about? And if I'm being honest, a lot of my time lately has been spent on invasive species and just pest control. Yeah. And that negativity, it like stacks up on you sometimes. <laughs> and you gave me the chance to talk about whatever I wanted. And so I decided I wanted to talk about one of my favorite groups of insects. So I just wanted to chat with the folks, uh, maybe acquaint them with or reintroduce them to the giant silk moths that live mm -hmm. here in North America. I'm kind of calling them the jewels of the night for this. Uh, this is a beautiful photo of a Cecropia moth by Alex Wild. If you ever want to see great insect photography, he really has a great dynamic gallery on his website if you find it. And you can see some of the relatives of these. I am, I, I love this group of insects. It's, it's kind of formative in my development as an entomologist. Um, I raised a Cecropia moth on accident uh, when I was in high school, and it was one of those things that kind of led me to the path that I'm on. And so I'm kind of excited to share a little bit of information about these critters here today. Uh, I, I always find it very intriguing when I get the opportunity to talk about sort of insects as beautiful things or, or interesting things, because I do a lot of these talks around the state, around the country. And in some instances, I ask folks, especially like master gardeners or master naturalists, to sort of share their feelings on insects. And they don't always expect that. They don't expect a scientist to, to dive into a feeling sort of uh, vibe. But when I give them the opportunity to do that, I get a lot of feedback on insects and I get a lot of words and adjectives that are kind of thrown around about insects. And I am always intrigued by some of the words that they use. Um, they usually focus on disgust. Um, people are kind of grossed out by insects by and large. Uh, some of the adjectives that I've heard in the past are that they are bizarre. Look at, uh, look at this grasshopper Katie did organism here on the far left looks kind of like he's staring at you. It's kind of weird. It's kind of funky. Um, other people talk about how gross they are or alien they appear to be. Here's the head of a fly in the center, and you can see it's mostly made up of its eyeballs, its compound eyes. Um, they have this weird, like, macho man, Randy Savage color transition in the middle. They have these strange finger-like antennal projections and a mouth that we don't quite understand. Other people, they just flat out call insects evil. Some of you may have seen this image on the far right here. Um, that was floating around on social media last year. This is the head of a carpenter ant, but it's been put in this like vignette sort of style photograph, uh, sort of a uh, filter, and it blurs out part of its eyes that are here in the back. And so it gives it this like evil eyebrow, purple fluorescent eyeball, evil mouth with like hair-like teeth appearance. Um, it's just the, sort of a trick of the doctoring of the photograph. In reality, they don't look like the, the face of a an orc from Lord of the Rings, but all of this kind of, I think, shows just how people feel they're so otherworldly and uncanny and just kind of odd. 
And I, I find that unfortunate, of course, as an entomologist. Uh, there is one group of insects that gets a pass from most people, I would say, and that's the Lepidoptera, specifically the butterflies that make up this group. People love butterflies. I mean, we get statues of them. People get tattoos of them. You can find cross-stitch patterns of butterflies. If you go to the zoo, they may have a butterfly house. They never have a, a grasshopper hut or a beetle house. It's always a butterfly house because people want to see these kind of winged wonders and, and marvel at the beautiful patterns that are on their wings. And it is usually very specific to the butterflies. Their cousins, the moths, their relatives, these are often kind of relegated to the background. Moths, by and large, are considered pests. Um, people think of moths as more pestiferous than the butterflies. And that is true that some of their larvae cause more damage than we would associate with the butterflies, though there are pest butterflies as well. Um, moths in the past used to be clothing pests, um, much more common when we, we had wool garments and things like that. And the other thing about moths is that they tend to be considered very drab. Uh, look at these moths here, you know, they're like brown and gray and white, and there's not a lot of interesting color or dynamic patterns. Some of them, you get some lines on them. Uh, they blend into bark or lichens that are on trees. But for a lot of people, they're just considered kind of boring. And because of this, as well as the fact that moths are usually around at night, this is one of the key differences between moths and butterflies. Butterflies are day-flying organisms by and large, whereas moths are usually active in the night. Um, that means that people don't really notice moths as often. They're not going to connect with them as often because they're out and about when we're asleep. When people think of moths, they either think of the, the sort of bad attributes or they may think of them as flying to lights. People who go outside at night now know, often notice lots of moths kind of buzzing around the street lights, or if you have a campfire, they may be attracted to the flame. And all of this just kind of means that the, the group as a whole is, is sort of forgotten. And I think that's unfortunate because it means that people are sleeping on this amazing group of insects. So we call them the Saturnids or Saturnidae. That's their family name. This is just a smattering of global diversity of Saturnids here. They're an ex just an exquisite looking group of insects. Um, I'm going to try and use as many adjectives for beauty as I can here today, but they're just, they're so interesting. There's so many patterns on their wings. Um, many of them look kind of like dead leaves. Um, another thing that we'll notice as we go through some images today is that there's a lot of eye spots. If we look at this atlas moth in the upper left-hand corner, one of the other famous things with this group is that their upper wing tips will be sort of snake-like in appearance. You can see an eye and a mouth here, and when they fold their wings up, it gives it more of that, that snake-like appearance, and that can deter predators from wanting to mess with them. So this group, I, I find when I talk to people that they don't often know about it. Um, they've not encountered them. If they have, it's been as pinned insects rather than actually out in nature, and I just wanted to share some of the ones that we have here in Kentucky with you today and encourage you to go out at night when you're camping or if you live in kind of a wooded area and, and try to meet some of these in action, in, in, in C2, I guess, is another way you could say it, and just kind of alive and doing their thing. Just some other sort of general facts about the Saturnids. Their, their family name, Saturnidae, it comes from the goddess Juno, who is the Roman goddess of marriage and childbirth. Her, one of her symbols is a peacock, and peacocks are important in association with Saturnids um, because of the eye spots. And one of the most famous European species is this one, the, the peacock moth. And you can see how it gets its name because it has very similar eye spots to the peacock on its wings. Vincent van Gogh actually painted one of these. There's a very famous painting by him um, of this particular moth that's very beautiful. But the, the name comes from this, this royal goddess. She's the goddess of marriage and childbirth. And actually, when we get into the naming conventions for a lot of these species, this seems to have impacted what people choose to name them. Uh, many of them have mythological names or names associated with royalty throughout history. They are also known as the giant silk moths or the giant silkworm moths, and that's because they're related to the more famous and domesticated silkworm moth, which we see some caterpillars of here. The silkworm produces a pupa, and then the pupa is encased in the silk that they make. Their silk is very luxurious. It's very fine. If you've ever worn silk clothing, you're wearing insect thread, basically, um, that they spun out of their butt. So, you know, that's why it's so luxurious and so expensive. And this one, they've been domesticated for thousands of years and kind of cultivated to have really nice silk. 
Our giant silk moths also produce silk, uh, but it's a very rough texture. It's tougher is often how it's described. If you ever encounter the cocoons of these, they're very hard to open if you try to do that. Um, and they'll have all of this silk that kind of folds leaves and protects them underneath. There have been attempts to use this silk before as a commercial enterprise, most famously by Leopold, Etienne Leopold Trouvelo, who was the one that brought the spongy moth to North America as a result of his failure with this particular silk. Uh, some other factoids would be that the majority of this family kind of flies in the depth of the night. Um, we're talking like midnight to 4 a.m. for a lot of these species. There are some exceptions, famously the polyphemus moth, which we see here. This is a twilight flyer. So most people that I've met that have seen a Saturnid, this is the one that they are familiar with because um, they've actually run into it kind of flying around on their property as the sun is setting. They also are interesting because as adults, they only live for about two weeks. So this sort of grandiose stage, this thing that I, I find very beautiful, it's really the smallest part of their overall life cycle. And this is because they only rely on fat reserves that they have from their caterpillar part of their life cycle. They don't have moth uh, mouth parts as adults. Uh, most moths have large proboscis mouth parts that they can siphon fluids out of flowers with. You see that with this white line sphinx over here. They kind of avert this proboscis down into the flower. All of the Saturnids pretty much lack this. If we look at their head, there is no mouth. It's greatly reduced or it's completely absent, like we see with this close-up on a Cecropia moth here on the left. Now, when we talk about them, I mentioned the polyphemus moth is probably the most uh, commonly encountered one that I've, I have met people talking about here in Kentucky. Um, I just want to show you some of the different species that you could go out here in the next couple of months and meet if you were so adventurous. And the first one I wanted to start with is polyphemus moth because it is kind of already going. They fly from April to May and then have a second generation in July and August here in Kentucky. Their wingspan is over five inches long. That's the other reason that I like this group is because people think of giant or interesting looking insects as being a sort of tropical phenomenon. But even here in humble Kentucky, we have these large and, and interesting looking insects. The caterpillars for this group are also quite big. We're talking four to six inches long in some cases. They usually look kind of like a big fluffy accordion. Um, they're very fat caterpillars and they have interesting patterns on their body as well. So this one looks like a big green accordion with kind of white stripes going down the side and then red breathing holes uh, paired up with those stripes. This is named after the Cyclops that appears in the Odyssey. Um, if you are uh, somebody that has different trees on your property or if you're going into a wooded area and you were interested in finding these, the caterpillar stage feeds mostly on birch, maple, oak, and hickory, amongst others. So you'll often find their cocoons on those trees as well. Another moth that's quite famous in the area is the Cecropia moth. This is the largest moth by wingspan in North America. Their wings can be up to seven inches wide. Um, which is quite amazing. Uh, when you put it on your hand, it just feels like a prehistoric thing is touching you. They can be seen flying now from, uh, from April into August. They are usually out around 3 to 4 a.m. That's when the female is going to be in the trees releasing pheromones to call the males to her. The adult is this beautiful mixture of brown, khaki, red, and kind of a white coloration interesting patterns on the wings as well. They look kind of staticky. Also have the snake eyes on the tips of the wings. They're very fuzzy. The caterpillar stage is famous for having these tubes that pop up uh, along the body that are in the primary colors. Uh, so we have red, yellow, and blue. There are spines on there, but these spines are false spines. They don't actually have any venom on, in them. This insect is named for the first king of Attica, an ancient kind of Grecian kingdom. And they feed on cherry, birch, plum, box elder, maple, and dogwood. That's where you would find these caterpillars hanging out and often where you'll find the adults uh, also mating and laying their eggs. Then the most famous of the Saturnids is probably the Luna moth. They are a bright green color. They're very beautiful coloration and these kind of long tails that come off of the bottom of the back wings. Their wings are only about four inches wide. They're flying from May into July here in Kentucky. Caterpillar stage is again a big green accordion with kind of a, a prominent head area. 
they're named after the Roman goddess of the moon. There was a sleep aid a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that used a Luna moth as its mascot, which I always found kind of a bit of interesting cultural entomology. Um, this caterpillar, they feed on, I think, an, an interesting array of food. You can find them on birch, but also persimmon, and then sweet gum and hickory. If you have any of those plants near your home, you may be more likely to encounter a luna moth, but there's just a beautiful, beautiful insect. Um, some of the other lesser known Saturnid moths would be the imperial moth. This is an insect that's also quite large, up to a six inch wingspan. You can find them from June through August. My daughter and I are actually rearing one of these right now. We found one of their pupa in the, in the last half of winter, I would say. It looked like a squirrel had dug it up. They actually don't produce a cocoon. They burrow into the soil and pupate, which is a little different compared to their cousins, uh, the other Saturnian moths. These are found on bald cypress, basswood, basswood, honey locust, sassafras, and hickory, amongst a few other species. This caterpillar is known for having these kind of four spines that project off the front part of the body, you can see here, but kind of an interesting green color and a hairy appearance. The regal moth, uh, it's not very well known as an adult, also known as the royal walnut moth. You can find them from May to September. They're also large, they're over six inches. They have this kind of infrared look to them, almost a negative color pattern like you would see on a reel of film. Uh, so very interesting color. But then as an immature, they're probably more famous. They're called the hickory horned devil. Um, some people, when you read about this on the internet, it's always said it's the size of a hot dog and it's covered in spikes. And it looks just kind of freaky to people. It's completely harmless. It's all ornamentation. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, they feed on hickory, pecan, uh, black walnut, as the name royal walnut might, might, might imply, as well as sweet gum trees. And then the Io moth, this is one of the smaller Saturnids. This is around April to September. Um, they're only about two and a half to three inches wide, but a beautiful yellow color paired with this kind of sort of maroon uh, stripes that go along the top wings. But then the back wings have these beautiful blue-white eye spots. They look vaguely like an owl's eyes, and they really pop when they open those top wings. The Io moth is named for Io, a, a goddess, a priestess, sort of in the Greek myth. And they feed on a, an interesting variety of things. They feed as caterpillars on birch, clover, maple, and oats. And this one is a stinging hazard. All of these spines on it, if you were to touch these, um, you would feel like you were stung sort of by a wasp or a bee. It can be quite painful. So we do try to warn people against touching any of these caterpillars just in case they are encountering the Io moth one. And then the final one I wanted to throw out is this beautiful pink and yellow moth. Just an interesting coloration, really pushes back against the idea that, that all moths are drab and boring. Um, it has this really nice coloration. You can actually find stuffed animal versions of this moth online. They're like two feet long and huge and puffy, um, and they sell like hotcakes. The, the store that sells them is often sold out of them. Uh, they're also smaller, about an inch and a half to two and a half inches wide with their wings, seen from April to September. They're also called the green striped maple worm moth because the immature larval stage is a, a green caterpillar with stripes, uh, not very creatively named there. Uh, famously feed on maple, as the name implies, but also can be found on sycamore, beech, and oaks. I love these insects, uh, like I sort of alluded to. I raised a cecropia moth when I was in high school, and it was one of those things that really captivated me and got me into entomology. I did a presentation for my 4-H project on giant silk moths talking about why they're important and why we should try to help them. They are considered to be in decline, many of these species. Um, they've been impacted by parasitoids that have been accidentally introduced, so flies that lay their eggs in them. The increase in squirrel populations in sort of suburban and urban areas have also led to declines in these because they'll eat the pupa when they find them. And we also, we don't plant as many different kinds of trees as, as we may be used to. And so if you want to help them, um, one of the big things is just making sure that you do plant a diversity of trees. Some of those species I mentioned today, you know, how many sweet gums do you see when you walk in the woods or when you walk around in your urban forest? How many beaches or, or sassafrases, all of these different trees do you encounter? Um, maples and oaks, you know, they're pretty common or more common relatively. But if we could put more out there, we would help them. And then reducing exterior lighting or switching to LED lights that are advertised as insect repellent 
um, or non-insect attractive. They'll have different wavelengths of light. So we attract fewer of the adults into that kind of death loop where moths are flying around a light. And then also reducing the collection of caterpillars and pupa. These are things that get caught and brought in or pictures have take, taken of them and stuff. And people are very curious about them. So we try to uh, teach people, you know, live and let live, kind of leave it where you find it. That way they're there to repopulate that area. But just one of my favorite things of insects, thank you, Renee, for letting me as an entomologist kind of ramble on about a group of moths. Uh, if there's anything that I can answer about them, uh, I would be happy to do so. Well, actually, to be honest, it was it was really nice to actually hear <laughs> something that's, you know, nice and not like killing everything. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> so I appreciate you doing that. I really do. And, you know, one thing I one question I have, I know if there's ever a moth trying to, you know, I'm trying to get it out of my house and I'm trying not to kill it. Um, like if it gets on your hands, you like you have that powdery. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> so uh, Lepidoptera, uh, the name of this order of insects, it means scaly wing. And it's referring to the fact that other, rather than most insect wings, which are membranous and see-through, uh, Lepidopterans, butterflies and moths, their wings are covered in this powdery material, these scales. And that's what gives them their shimmer and their color. But when we touch it, it rubs off and it gets stuck to your fingers. And it's like pixie dust sort of. Um, and then you'll be able to see through that part of the wing. Okay. That sounds really Loved it, Jonathan. Your images are that you selected for that. <laughs> a so lot of those come from my colleague Rick Besson. Um, yeah. He he has a, a fact sheet online right. in our on our entomology webpage all about these. Yeah. Uh, so I, I borrowed heavily from that. Just hey, teamwork makes the dream work, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> there was a question that popped up. It looked like um, what biomimicry can human engineers use for moths? Oh, biomimicry, as, yeah. as in like. How they mimic each other, mimic the things that they're sitting on. Kind of well, thing. I'm assuming it's kind of taking what we see in nature and trying to apply it to our machines and tools or or something like that. I, I'm not really 100 sure, Chris. If you want to, oh, okay. all right, that's what he's saying. I, yeah. I would say that when we talk about uh, like biomechanical stuff with Lepidoptera, it's usually about the caterpillar, and it focuses on how their bodies scrunch and move, um, and we want to be able to mimic that for traction for certain robotics. Uh, rather than have wheeled uh, apparatus on the sides, if you could get it to just be like an inchworm and project, it, project itself forward, locomote itself forward like that. That's what I have seen, at least. Yeah, I haven't heard of anybody trying to make something that flies like a moth. Mm -hmm. If we could ever biomimic their antenna, uh, the chemical reception abilities that they have with that, that would be amazing. We would be able to smell a lot of different smells than we have right now. I don't know that we would like that. Uh, you, 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 <laughs> no, you don't want to know. It might be overwhelming, right? <laughs> Our brains might not be able to handle that. Like psychic abilities for you. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> oh. exactly. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh. I hope people over the next couple months go out and, and try to find these. You would be out like midnight to, to 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, if you go around lights, you can find them. They don't come to baits. Other moths, you can sort of make a molasses and yeast mixture and paint it on trees and they'll come and fly to this. But since these don't eat, that won't work. Uh, so you'll have to go to, to lights or put up a black light and you might encounter one of these giant moths and, and hopefully find it beautiful. Without a doubt. As thank always, you. Dr. Larson. Yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Good deal. Yeah, that was really interesting. I really enjoyed you that. You know, segment. it's always a treat to have Dr. Larson on. And it is. Yep. Big thanks to him. Um, all right, so we're going to keep the show rolling. We are we're going to switch gears from moths to killing trees. Killing um, trees. <laughs> yes. Now, I always say it's, it's beneficial, though, right? right? Trees are the answer, right? But sometimes trees might be in the way of what you're trying to do. And often in forestry and woodland management and wildlife management as well, it requires removal of some trees to free up growing space for other trees. And if you're going to do it, we want to make sure you do it right and safely. And we also want to make sure you do it as efficiently and cheaply as possible, right? We don't want to waste any time or money um, or, or effort. So Dr. Stringer, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this morning, has put together a video. I think, Renee, you had worked with some of this, and um, we also had our good friends over at Ag Communications here at UK have put this together a nice video. I really think this is going to be a nice resource that people will be able to come back to and use as they're thinking about how to go about managing their woodlands. Um, so I guess without any further ado, we'll Share the video. Wonderful.
There's a number of different treatments that can be used uh, for controlling trees and forestry operations. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what those different methods are. Um, but first, it's always good to think about and understand a little bit of, uh, in this case, the, the organism or the tree that you're trying to kill. And you'll notice here, standing next to a, to a beech tree, you can see here the, the, uh, the root system that's coming out of that, how it's got these big lateral roots and stuff. And the reason I'm pointing this out to you is when you're trying to treat, in our applications, we're trying to treat this tree and kill it, uh, you're trying to kill a pretty big organism. You know, it, it may be in this case 30 or 40 foot tall. Uh, it contains a lot of weight and a lot of, a lot of biomass above us, if you will. In the same way underground, it's got an extensive root system. So it's good to understand that what you're trying to treat here and kill uh, in this case, um, there's, a, there's a lot of plant to try to do that with. And um, it's also important to understand a little bit about uh, the structure of a tree because that helps understand uh, some of these techniques that we're gonna be talking about. And I've got a cross section here. We cut this off of a, a yellow poplar tree a, a few minutes ago. But what I wanna show you right here is this is the cross section. Of course, here's the outer, outside and the outer bark, okay? Uh, in this cross section, you can see the outer bark is this area right here, okay? And that's pretty pronounced and that's pretty obvious, okay? Directly below that is a very thin line here and you can kind of tell the difference between this tissue right here and the bark and this the thin line of tissue right here and, and what's inside of it, okay? That thin line right there is what we call the inner bark or phloem. And that's important tissue in the tree. And the reason we're talking about this because this is the, this little, this little line of, of, of cells right here, this phloem, is what translocates or moves uh, the sugars that are produced in leaves down the stem and into the roots. So if we're trying to uh, kill the roots of the tree and kill the total tree out, we're gonna wanna make sure that our herbicide gets to that phloem so that it can be transported down into the, into the root system. Now, inside of the phloem, of course, is wood. Uh, you can see a little bit of the growth rings on this. They're not very pronounced in poplar, other species they are. So what's the, what's the wood do? Well, the outer rings in the wood are responsible for moving water from the roots up to the top. But this is starting to develop heartwood in the middle, and that heartwood represents dead cells. There's nothing living in heartwood. Okay. Why is that important? Because um, you don't have to worry about getting chemical all the way to the middle of the tree because it's the, that, that tissue, that wood is dead anyway. Um, you do want to make sure that you do get some chemical in the phloem and in some of the outside uh, several rings right here, the, what's called the sap wood of the tree. The reason it's good to know something about how a tree is put together because a number of our techniques are designed to make sure that you get the chemical or the herbicide placed to the, into the tissue that it needs to be in order for you to, uh, for it to be effective in, in, in killing the tree. So it's good to keep all this uh, basic uh, tree structure and function, if you will, uh, in mind. Now, if we talk about uh, treating a tree and there's, there's, we, can, we can think of it from two perspectives. One is, um, you can ask the question, uh, do we just need to kill the top of the tree or do we need to also kill the roots and kill the whole tree? And for example, there are silvicultural treatments, forest management treatments out there like crop tree release where we have a stand that's maybe, uh, you know, uh, five, six inches in diameter and there are certain trees that, that we want to uh, remove competition from around them, okay? So in that case, let's say this was competing, this is a beech tree, let's say it was competing with, a, with an oak that we were wanting to favor and continue to grow and we were wanting to remove the competition of this tree from that, from that oak tree. Well, we could do that simply by cutting this tree down because that would certainly remove the competition, the leaf area and the crown of this tree from imposing upon the crown of our, of our crop tree, uh, an, an oak in this case, in, in our example. And we would have met our objective there of removing this competition uh, from, that, from that oak tree of similar size. However, if we wanna kill this tree, we have to be concerned about also killing the root system because when you, when you kill the top of the tree or you cut the tree off and remove the top, um, the, a tree like this is gonna sprout back from the suppressed buds that are contained around the, uh, around the ground line. So when you cut this off, all those will sprout back so you haven't killed the tree, 
okay? In order to kill a tree, you have to be able to get, uh, be able to kill the root system out. And that's why those transportive tissues like the phloem and understanding where they're at and, and talking to you about them is important to understand because that's how the chemical is going to get down into the root system uh, to kill the tree out. If we were dealing with invasive species control where you certainly want to kill the tree or the shrub or the bush, the woody plant, and you want to get rid of it, you want to kill that root system. So making sure that our, any of our treatments uh, can get into the tissue and into the tree in a way that it gets down there and kills the roots is very important. Now, forestry use chemicals, there's a few of them uh, that you can, you can get the herbicide into the tree by applying it to the soil. So there's soil application herbicides. We don't use those too often. Um, the right to way, um, uh, they, they, use, they use soil application um, uh, chemicals sometimes uh, for right away treatments and that kind of thing. The problem with using soil applied treatments uh, in the woods like this is uh, where you apply that herbicide in the soil, anything that has uh, roots that come into contact with that area where that herbicide spreads in the soil is likely to be killed. Uh, and a lot of times we have good trees as well as, as trees we don't want to, trees we want to value, that have value and we want to manage for and ones that we don't. And we certainly don't want to be using uh, soil applied um, uh, herbicide in, in those kind of environments. But they, they are out there and you may, you may see them. Um, so the other way then to get, to get the, um, the uh, herbicide into the tree is uh, foliar treatment. Uh, you can spray the foliage of the tree and, and the herbicide. There's lots of herbicides out there that, are, that can be used for a foliar application. The problem there is if you've got a tree like this, you can't treat the foliage because it's too tall unless you have a helicopter. And in forestry applications, helicopter and, 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 uh, and fixed wing uh, airplane are used to apply herbicides to broad areas uh, in forest. And that particularly occurs things like, for example, in pine management and that kind of thing where we're replanting into pine and you want to control the vegetation across the whole area. But in, in a lot of times with in mixed hardwood sands like this, when we're talking about controlling individual trees, that fuller application really is not appropriate unless the trees are very small or the brush or the woody plants are very small and, and you can actually get to the foliage. So the majority of the treatments that we commonly use uh, involve um, either spraying a specific type of herbicide on the outside of the bark of the tree, and it has to be very, a very specific herbicide that has the ability to penetrate that bark. Um, uh, you know, and get to that, that inner bark of that phloem uh, where then it can be transported down into roots. And that's called a basal bark treatment. Uh, and there, like I said, that, that there's only uh, a limited number of herbicides, forestry use herbicides that can be, that, that, that can do that. Um, uh, Garlon 4 is a traditional one. It's a triclopyr, it's a ester formulation of Garlon 4, which ester simply means that it is uh, nonpolar. Uh, so it has the ability to penetrate this bark, which has a lot of nonpolar tissue in it, if you will. Um, you know, um, polar compounds or polar herbicides, amine formulation herbicides, are designed to be mixed in water. They're soluble in water. Okay, um, and if you apply those to the outside bark, the bark is resistive to water moving into it, so it'll just run off. Okay. Now, the, so the main, the, the, the majority or the main way and the majority of the herbicide uh, uh, application method for killing trees is going to involve breaking through the bark and applying the herbicide to the internal tissues of the tree. So bypassing the, bypassing the bark uh, and being able to get the herbicide directly into the into the tree, and now uh, the the uh, the most uh, so the the simplest way of doing this is to cut the tree off. Uh, so you can cut the tree off. You know that exposes. Uh, if this was attached to the roots and that kind of thing, it would expose all these uh, internal tissues of that tree, the 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 phloem and the sapwood and all that kind of thing. That gets it out there where we can easily spray chemical on it, spray herbicide on it. Right, and then that allows that that uh, that fresh tissue to carry that that herbicide down into the root system. And that particular treatment is called a cut stump treatment. So you make a stump, cut the stump, expose the stump, and spray the spray the herbicide on it. The other methods of, of treating individual trees have to do with with cutting through the bark of the tree. And and uh, there are treatments, uh, for example, called hack and squirt, where you take a hatchet and you cut through the bark of the tree. Uh, that hatchet goes into the phloem, goes into the outer sapwood, it exposes that in that slit that's created by the hatchet, and you spray the chemical, 
uh, right into that slit. And there, there are a number of forestry use herbicides that, um, that are designed for hack and squirt treatments. And they will tell you uh, how many slits uh, uh, that you have to put into the tree, what the spacing needs to be, all that kind of thing, you know, and how much herbicide to apply in each slit. So what you're doing with that treatment is you're bypassing the bark, you're getting through the bark. Okay. And there are other treatments like that as well. Uh, tree injectors, a treatment where you use something like this um, that has herbicide in the, in, the, in, the, in the tube right here, and it's got a blade on the end of it, just like a hatchet would be, and it penetrates, you, you hit the tree with it, it penetrates the bark, and you spray the, spray the uh, herbicide into, into the slit made by this. Okay. So um, you can take a chainsaw, for example, um, and girdle the tree. Uh, and spray the herbicide into the girdle. Um, and so there are a number of different treatments and, and ways that you can go about making sure that we can apply the, the chemical in a way or the herbicide in a way that it gets to the tissue uh, that it needs to, to be distributed through the tree and, and ultimately gonna be able to, to kill it out. Now, some of the treatments have certain times of the year um, that they're, they're best applied in and some times of year that they shouldn't be and the label is gonna say that. Um, and so pay a particular attention to the label uh, when, it, when it comes to that as far as uh, time of the year. And it'll also talk about what uh, a tree size to use it on. Uh, for example, that basal bark treatment that we talked about earlier where you're spraying chemical on the outside of the bark of the tree, um, it can only be used on smaller trees that have thin bark. And once the trees progress in size, they get thicker bark and that treatment's not effective. And it'll have that information on diameter of tree, uh, maximum diameter of tree of that, of, of that um, uh, uh, to be used in. And then the labels will also include uh, what species, species are easy to kill, what species might be hard to kill. That's good to know and they will often tell you what to do and what treatment to use or how to apply it for treatment for species that are that are hard to kill. So all of that information, um, the species that can be used on, um, the size of the trees that can be treated, um, you know, how to apply the chemical, what time of the year, all those kind of things um, are found in the label. And you want to be using uh, 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 herbicides that are, that are labeled for use in the forest and non-crop areas and things of that nature. So make sure in the label that you're using a, a, using a brand of, a, of herbicides that is labeled for use in this environment. And the label will have that, as well as information on how to apply it and time of the year and all those kind of things and, and safety issues that you need to be they need to be dealing with as well. So it's it's good to remember that a tree is a uh, by is a is a big organism, um, has a big root system under the ground that we can't see, um, has a lot of biomass to it. Uh, we're typically applying very little herbicide uh, to to an organism this size, so it needs to be done correctly at the right time of the year, applied in the right way, uh, uh, and, and all of that uh, to be in order to be effective. And our, our Forestry um, herbicides have been around, some of them for, for a long time. We have lots of experience with them and they do an effective job in controlling uh, individual trees. You know, we appreciate that uh, Dr. Jeff Stringer took the time out to do those uh, for us, and we will have those on uh, on our YouTube channel for people to watch because I know there's a lot there was a lot of information in a short amount of time there. Yeah, it was great stuff. I really appreciate that. We've covered a lot of ground as far as um, the various different treatments in that, and it'll be a great resource for folks going forward. So um, yeah, a big thanks to Dr. Stringer and the team um, for putting that together, for sure. Definitely, definitely. Well, now we're going to move on to what's that fungus? <laughs> so Megan, Megan yeah. Bulin is here to tell us what is that fungus, Megan? <laughs> hey, how are you all doing today? Doing great. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about chanterelle fungi. So this is maybe a little bit premature yet this year, but I just can't help but want to talk about these fungi today because they're one of my favorite groups of mushrooms. And we should be expecting them to start popping up here in Kentucky within the next month or six weeks or so. We should see these popping up in our forests and woodlands and maybe even in your backyard. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about how to identify chanterelle fungi, but just as important we're going to be talking about one of their trickiest lookalikes that people sometimes confuse chanterelles with. So uh, yeah, that's what we're going to be chatting about today. These are chanterelles. 
They belong to the group Chanterellus. There are several different genera within this group, but we'll just call them chanterelles for, for the sake of simplicity. All chanterelles are going to have a few characteristics in common. They're mycorrhizal. That's why you'll almost always find chanterelles occurring in groups. You'll very rarely find one chanterelle alone. So even if the others are hidden under the leaf litter, it's a good, good chance that where you find one, there are more nearby. Chanterelles all, all have, almost all have either a orange or reddish orange cap. There are a couple exceptions within this group that come in different colors. They'll be lighter in color. There's one species that is very dark, almost black, but most chanterelles are going to be orange. So chanterelles tend to grow in groups. They don't grow in clusters. And this is an important diagnostic feature to distinguish them from another species of fungus that at first glance can often look deceptively like chanterelles. Jack-o-lantern fungi uh, look very similar to chanterelles, but they tend to grow in true clusters, usually from a piece of rotten wood or from the ba decaying base of a tree. And jack-o-lantern fungi are uh, poisonous and should never be confused with chanterelles. So that's an important uh, distinguishing character to keep in mind that those chanterelles tend to grow in groups, they're not growing together in clusters. Chanterelles don't have true gills like most fungi do. They have veins instead, which can look a little bit like gills, but are not quite as distinct. So if you look at the underside, you'll see these ridged, forked um, veins that occur on the underside of the cap, and these are very characteristic of chanterelles. Usually these veins will fork near the edges of the cap as well, which is another helpful ID key for these fungi. Chanterelles, when you break them apart, will always be white on the inside of the mushroom, as opposed to the jack-o'-lantern fungi that we talked about, which when cut in half will be orange all the way through. Another helpful feature to distinguish these two groups from each other. So I could definitely see why you could get those two mixed up, Megan. I, I mean, that would be very easy if you did not know what you were looking at. Oh yeah, you know, they're, they can be tricky. They're, uh, they're a little bit difficult to tell apart sometimes if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, and that's why I wanted to talk about this in just a little bit more detail today, because while that video does provide a little bit of overview, you know, I also wanted to take a few minutes to talk about this concept. So we have a few slides here that uh, if you don't mind, Renee, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll talk a little bit more about chanterelles and then how to tell them apart from those tricky jack-o'-lantern fungi. All right. So here we have a lovely little chanterelle mushroom. And this is, this is a true chanterelle. This is the group you're looking for. Now, a little bit about chanterelle fungi uh, is that it's not just one or two species. Chanterelle fungi is kind of a general name for a group of fungi that are made up of 46 different species just in North America, which is wild. And these fungi belong primarily to two different genera, the cantharellus and the craterellus which isn't too important from just a general understanding of how to ID them, but it does become important if you're trying to identify these using any kind of a field guide or a mushroom ID book, because there you will want to know that, you know, not all chanterelles are in craterellus or cantharellus. It's these two different uh, genera that make up the majority of chanterelles. And so it's important to keep in mind this distinction that these two genera, we call them all chanterelles, but they're actually two different uh, taxonomic groups of mushrooms for ID purposes. Uh, and yeah, about 46 different species. There's a couple other uh, genera that have species thrown into the chanterelle group as well, but they're just kind of not the predominant members of the group around here. And these species, like we said in the video, they are mycorrhizal. And that means that they have symbiotic relationships with different species of trees. And this is a relationship that is mutualistically beneficial to both parties. The mushrooms benefit usually by uh, acquiring nutrients from the tree and the tree benefits by the, the fungi, that mycorrhizal fungi extending the tree's network a little bit, so to speak, and helping it acquire 
their nutrients and water. Uh, so it is a mutually beneficial relationship. They're not pathogens uh, on these trees. They're, they are helpful. And it's important to keep in mind, you know, what species these chanterelles like to associate with. Because if you want to go out and maybe find some chanterelles, well, you're not going to want to go to a pine forest around here. Uh, you're going to want to go look for one of our oak forests, someplace dominated by oak, oak, beech, and hickory is going to be a really good bet for finding chanterelle fungi because these are the species that most chanterelles are associated with mycorrhizally. So chanterelles range in color as well as a group. They are kind of diverse and all over the place, which is cool. Uh, they range in color from red, to orange, to yellow, and even black. There's a lot of different colors of chanterelles. A lot of them are going to be this red or orange color, uh, but some of them are going to be other colors as well, like black or, or bright red in color. Uh, and so this, this is a pretty diverse group of fungi, uh, and they do tend to fruit over a long period of time. They fruit from late spring to mid-fall here in eastern North America, uh, and that's going to be different species fruiting over that time period. It's not like one species of chanterelle that fruits the entire time. It's all of these different species that live here that are fruiting in different windows, but we have one chanterelle or another fruiting for almost that entire period of time. And you can see just a little bit of the diversity in what this group of fungi look like. They can be a little bit all over the place in their morphology and the way they look, but these are all chanterelles. And you can see the false gills, the pseudo gills that they have on the underside of the cap that we talked about in the video uh, that are really one of the best giveaways for chanterelles. You can see how the gills fork near the margin of the cap and how they aren't true gills. So on the left, you have a picture of a chanterelle. And on the right, you have a picture of this tricky lookalike, the jack-o'-lantern fungi, the uh, Omphalotus eludens fun fungus. And the jack-o'-lantern fungus on the right, the bright orange mushroom, he has true gills. There are these blade-like um, gills that run along the entirety of the underside of the cap. And these are true gills like you see on a lot of mushrooms. Whereas the chanterelle on the left, he has pseudo gills or false gills, you might hear them called. And they tend to not be as distinct, not as deep as the true gills that you see in the mushroom on the right. Uh, and they also tend to fork near the margin of the cap. And I do feel this side-by-side -side comparison is one of the easiest ways to really get a feeling for that di distinctive difference between true gills and the pseudo gills or false gills that you will see with chanterelle fungi. All right, so a little bit more about this lookalike mushroom because it is really important that you can tell this mushroom apart from, from chanterelles. Every year, there are people who pick jack-o'-lantern fungi thinking that they found some chanterelles, uh, and sometimes with some very serious consequences. This mushroom can make you very sick if you ingest it, uh, and people have fed this to their families, to their kids, and people have been really ill, dangerously ill sometimes as a result. So it is really important that you be able to tell this mushroom apart from your chanterelle fungi. Uh, so a little bit about these jack-o'-lantern fungi, you know, how to make sure that you can really tell them apart. Uh, they have true gills, like we talked about, instead of the false gills of the chanterelles. And jack-o'-lantern fungi are parasites. We talked about how mycorrhizal, how chanterelles are mycorrhizal fungi. Jack-o'-lanterns are parasitic fungi. They feed on a living tree or sometimes a recently dead tree as a host. And they tend to grow in clumps or clusters at the base of trees, especially around uh, oak trees. They're parasitic on oak trees. The interior flesh of this mushroom is orange when you slice it open rather than white like in chanterelles. Uh, chanterelle mushrooms tend to have white interior flesh when sliced with a couple of exceptions, which we won't worry about right now. But these jack-o'-lantern fungi, they tend to have orange flesh all the way through when you slice them open. And that's a really important diagnostic feature. And jack-o'-lantern fungi, they tend to fruit in late summer to early fall only. That's the only time you're going to find these guys fruiting, not in the spring, not in June or July, but only in that late summer to early fall time period here in Kentucky and other parts of the eastern U.S. it is different. And finally, you know, I think this is fun. According to popular culture, you may have heard this before, that jack-o'-lantern fungi glow in the dark. 
Um, and whether or not this is true is a little bit uh, up for debate. Some people swear that they have seen these mushrooms grow glowing in the dark, and other people are not so sure that this is a thing. I, you know, I, I can say myself that I have spent um, more than a little bit of time seated maybe in a dark closet with a cluster of jack-o'-lantern mushrooms waiting and waiting in vain for them to glow and to produce this beautiful green bioluminescence that they supposedly produce. I have never seen it. A lot of other people have never seen it, but if you are hiking out in the woods at night, maybe you're out camping or for a night hike and you see this eerie green glow in the woods, it might be some jack-o'-lantern fungi. And if you do happen to see them, please send me a picture because I would love to get this on camera. All right, so that's all that we have to talk about today for the jack-o'-lantern fungi and the chanterelles, but I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up about telling these two apart. Well, Josh Perry mentioned that his farm was covered in chanterelles right before he bought it a couple of years ago, and last year he saw none. You know, that's... That that's be? Do you have any idea? That can happen. And there's a few different reasons why that might occur. You know, there are some species of chanterelles that can have bumper crop years, right? Like what Mr. Perry was mentioning, where you, they're just everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's chanterelles and it's amazing. And then the next year or two, maybe there won't be many there at all. There's so many things about mushrooms and especially some of these mycorrhizal fungi that we still don't understand exactly how they work all the time. Uh, so there are different factors that can influence how, how many mushrooms you have in a certain year, just like some of our oak trees or uh, pine trees where some years you have a bumper crop of seed and other years you might not have very much at all. Mushrooms can be the same way and we don't always understand everything that's happening there ecologically. Uh, but often a lack of rain is one of the most common culprits. If you don't have enough rain or enough precipitation in the right time of the year, it can really affect the ability for those mushrooms to fruit. So that could be a possibility. But hopefully the mushrooms will be back. Very often they might taper off for a couple of years and then you'll have another awesome year. So maybe this year, you never know. Maybe. <laughs> Gosh, there's hope. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed for you. Yes, um, hopefully it will work out. Now, Megan, I really appreciate that. You, you might save somebody's life with that information you've shared today. So it's really good. I think it's just a general reminder. You shouldn't consume any mushrooms <laughs> unless you have a hundred percent identification, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, mushrooms, I, I love fungi. They're one of my passions. I think they're amazing. Uh, and I've been learning about mushrooms and how to ID them for quite a number of years now and even now there are very few I'm very cautious myself personally and you're um, an expert at other it, people so, yeah. to, do it, to be as well you, know, you you never want to take a chance with something like this something that I like to remind people of when I give these presentations is that we are so lucky we live in a place where most people have access to fresh food and a grocery store whenever they want it and for me personally since that is the case what well, I don't Think that it's worth it to ever risk consuming something that could damage that I could damage myself or someone else for a meal that I don't need. But they're amazing. They're wonderful to to ID and to photograph and to observe. And there are a few that are delicious. You just have to be uh, kind of careful when you're out looking for them. So are the black chantels when you cut them? Are they also white? They're not, they're one of, then thank you for mentioning that, Renee. They're one of those exceptions we were talking about. They're actually, a, you know, very dark gray to black when you slice into them. Uh, but those black chanterelles, they're tricky to find. They tend to be very small and brittle in comparison to some of the large orange chanterelles that we have. And they're down there on the forest floor. They're hard to spot. Uh, but when you do spot them, they, uh, they, they are really pretty little mushrooms. Nice. You gave us inspiration to go out and look in the woods, both you and Dr. Larson. So thank you both for sure. Oh, thank you all. Well, really great show today. Like I said, we had a variety of topics and it was all very, very interesting. Yes, I really appreciate all, appreciate all of our guests. You know, it's so neat to see the natural world from different perspectives. And, you know, Jonathan and Megan helped us so much in that in different ways. Uh, and then we had Dr. Stringer really provide a great resource when it comes to trying to treat trees that you're trying to control in, a, in an environmental setting. So, yeah, big thanks to all of our guests. And I was going to say, Renee, if you give me just a second, I wanted to plug a program we've got coming next Tuesday. Sure. And I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to it for everybody in the chat pod. But I'll just share the screen real quick with you um, and we'll let everybody know. We've mentioned this a time or two on the show, but we do have a workshop 
that's coming up at the Bullitt County Extension Office this coming Tuesday, May 23rd from 6 to 8.30. We do ask you to register. We will be um, providing a mail for that. But this is a great opportunity, Renee, for landowners that may not know who can help them or how to get started in caring for their land. So we're going to have representatives there from some really key organizations here in Kentucky that are available to work with landowners on a one-on-one -on -one basis on their own property. So I'll encourage our viewers, if you know of somebody that could benefit from this information and these connections, please encourage them to register for our workshop. Um, you've got the link in the um, in the chat pod, and we'd love to have you all out there with us. So thanks, Renee. Yeah, and you're going to be one of the presenters too. So that's even that you know that's even better. <laughs> yeah, some other kind of um, I guess a, a cast and characters from the show will exactly. be exactly. Well. I know Dr. Amanda Gumbert. We have Jacob mm -hmm. Stewart. Fish and Wildlife is coming on. Um, he's going to be there with us. Uh, uh, Amanda um, from um, the, excuse me, not Bridget Abernathy, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> Amanda and Bridget, um, but Bridget Abernathy from the Kentucky Division of Forestry. She's going to be there as well. So yeah, a great lineup of uh, presenters and speakers. We're going to be hearing from local extension offices. We also have one of the more prominent woodland owners here in Kentucky um, that's going to be talking about his experience, right? How he has worked with these organizations and agencies. And I think landowners can learn so much from what we're going to learn um, from him about how he kind of navigated the process. Because uh, Renee, a lot of times people just are unaware that there's people that can help them and there may be programs or other um, things that they can latch on to that they can then use on their own property. So we're really going to try to demystify that and make it easier for people to make those connections. So again, if you know of anybody that could benefit from understanding the, these opportunities out there to be land stewards, let us let them know about this program. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Again, great show. Lots of information, lots of things to uh, to look at and even uh, maybe need to rewatch uh, in a couple of weeks from now. Um, so we greatly appreciate you joining us. And we, you know, next week um, we're going to have Dr. Ellen Crocker talk about a pesky plant. Um, you know, there's going to there's always some out there that she's going to be able to tell us about. And uh, Lori Thomas will be back with another tree of the week. So we're looking forward to that. No so we greatly enjoy uh, enjoy you being with us. And if you have any comments or any suggestions whatsoever, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and drop us a line. And you never know when we might run your story idea. No doubt. We've done it before and we'd be lo we would love to do it again. So thank you again for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next week at 11. Take care. Bye. From the Woods Today.